But what I wanted to talk about today, and it piggybacks on all kinds of other things, we're always kind of talking about the same, the same basic principles, but you realize when you talk to people uh, how necessary it is to keep talking about these same basic principles. Um, because when you're out in the world, you easily forget about um, the simplicity of the spiritual life because you're immersed in something that's very complicated. The world is very, very complicated. Uh, the spiritual life is actually quite simple. So the more you're immersed in the world, the more complicated you think the spiritual life is. So there you go. But what we want to look at today, I just want to look at good example. Good example and our covenant with God. Uh, and the reason I bring it up this way is because if we really look at the way um, we look at those final few days of our Lord before his passion, he comes into Jerusalem triumphantly. He he just a little bit before that raised somebody from the dead. That was a big deal. I mean everybody did. I mean he did all kinds of things. But then when he raised this guy from the dead, Lazarus, that was a big deal. Everybody's talking about it now. They come out and are proclaiming him basically king, and the 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 the, the people who are in charge, the authority of the church, are actually quite scandalized. We knew we know that they've been completely against him the whole time. Um. But then they start to work together. You have all these factions start to work together against Christ. They're united in crushing the Christ. And they know he's the Christ. They have to know he's the Christ, but he's not what they want. And there's, that's where the parables come in, that I didn't get to write many of these down. But that's where the parables come in of our Lord talking about, you know, a king who has a, you know, a vineyard in a far off land and he sends... He sends multiple servants to go there. Then he sends his own son. They beat one. They kill another. They stone another. Um, and then, then they ask him, what would you do? And our Lord just says, what, what would you do then to, to these people? And they say, the ones who are doing the same thing to Christ, um, that you should put those miserable wretches to, 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 a, to, a, to death. right? And so our Lord's getting them to say what their punishment ought to be. And he's saying it, oh, he's, he's giving them parable after parable, showing them they deserve to die. Now, let's talk about what that means, because we're taught what, what I want to get to is covenant. And I want to look at that from from the point of view of our good example. What we're trying to do is drill it into our heads what it means to be holy out in the world, because so many of you have an idea that a give good example means to just show people a good way of living, though you're not really living that way. Do you see that? That's the thing. We have a contradiction. We live contradictorily in the world. We have our private life and we have our public life. We've given many conferences about this before, but this is this this came from kind of a different. It's good to kind of hit it again, but it comes from a different uh, a different angle, I think, in looking at what our covenant is with God. So we are bound to give good example. And we all know we're bound to give good example because when you give bad example, you feel bad about it. And that's why we hide, we hide our private life. We don't want them to see how nasty we are to our family members. We don't want them to see the things that we do in private that are disgusting and perverted. We don't want them to see all the other things that we know are wrong. You don't want anybody to see that face. You want them to see the positive face. That's the good example. Is that the good example? Is that is that actually what we need to do? So that's what I want to look at. So we look at we can look at this in two different ways. <clears throat> we have the example that we tend to give, and that's the example of our external self. We would say our public face, right? And then we have the then then but then there's our private life. What we actually need to do is we have to make an understanding of how to switch the two. Because let, let me let me go and let me, let me get through this. I don't want to jump too far ahead because what I want to talk about is what our private life actually is and what our public life actually is. So we have a better understanding. OK. So if we don't put example into proper context. We might think that we can justify our hidden life of fault and sin, of hidden backbiting and murmuring against our neighbor, of being nasty to our family, 
and those closest to us, of spending our time in indecent pursuits and letting our eyes or our mind pursue filthy things, while still in a holy, while still giving a holy face to the world, oftentimes that holy face that we give is our good example. Do you see? And if that indeed is our good example, that we really think that that's a good example that we're giving, like I'm going to be charitable uh, to this person because there's this person at the parish that really annoys me. I don't like them. When I'm not around them, I actually talk about them. But when I'm around them, I'm going to be very joyful. I'm going to give them a happy smile. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to give them a good word. Do you see? Everybody thinks you're really good with this person. It's very difficult to deal with. And then when you leave, backbiting nastiness, horrible thoughts of the person. You'd you rather not see them ever. Now, that's a, we, we have those people in our lives. It doesn't, it, it's not wrong to have somebody in your life that you do not want to see, okay? That's not, that's not a bad thing necessarily because those people are real people in our lives that, you know what, I just don't like being around that person. I don't like being around that person. But it doesn't give a justification for the backbiting. We know all that stuff, all the, all the sinful stuff. We're, not, we're still not allowed to do that. We still have to, we have to keep our mouth shut. And it's okay not to want to see them. But when we do see them, we don't treat them as an enemy because they're not an enemy. They're just somebody I really would rather not be around because it's, it's just hard for me. They're always you know, kind of dumping or they're doing, you know, we know the situations, all the many different situations. But in all charity, if that person needs anything, I'm there. But when they're not there, I'm not going to be destroying them. Do you see the difference? And, the, and the, it can go on and on with all the things that we, we hide. That's why we have to, anyways, that we hide in our, in, our, in our hidden life that might be things that offend our dear Lord. So we've just come out of Holy Week. We perhaps read and reflected on how the Jews strove with all their might just before our dear Lord's passion to ensnare him in his words. That's what was happening. You had, you had the Sanhedrin, basically. You had the, the Sadducees and you had the Pharisees and you had the, um, um, uh, the Herodians. You had the lawyers. They're one after another coming to him. It's not just a simple fact that the, you know, that M Matthew, the evangelist, and Luke, the evan or Mark, the evangelist, they just bring this up like, oh, here's a bunch of stuff that happened that week, and he's just going to like read one after another, just write one right after another. That's not necessarily what happened. What he's showing you is that our Lord comes in, and they send one group after another trying to ensnare him. They're bringing all these things against them, asking them these complicated things about marriage, asking them about money. Remember the, the coin? And every single time, he just simply says a couple of things and destroys their whole argument. And one of, the, one of the most, one of the biggest arguments of the time, I forget what it was. I think it was the, it wasn't marriage. I think it was the, the giving, um, the payment to Caesar was one of the biggest questions of the time because you know they had their theological disputes like we have our theological disputes they wanted to sort through the stuff and come up with answers so they're at, at that time like at the time of blessed John Duns Scotus they're, they're they're trying to figure out the Immaculate Conception they're, they're disputing it and they're talking about so that was a controversial thing back then in some way because they're trying to figure out theologically where you're coming from? What was redemption? How did it? How was it applied by our Lord? Well, at this time, where our Lord's there, the, the, these these different groups, the authority of the church, they're they're disputing giving money to Caesar, or taking money, using money that Caesar's. What what do you give to Caesar, and what do you give to God? And so, th this is our Lord just resolves it with that. Is it right to give to give? Uh, to, to make the payment or not? Is it right to pay the tax or not? To use And so he just asks for the coin. And he resolves it right there. you got to give to God what's God's. you got to give to Caesar what's Caesar's. They don't have anything else to say. And he did it with all of the other instances where they're coming at him. So this is what we're talking about. This is where we're at. And then they say to him, because they don't know what else to say. They're stuck. This guy has wiggled his way out. Because what are they going to do? They get him to say the wrong thing, like about marriage. Moses was wrong. 
he doesn't say Moses is wrong. He just he shows how Moses made an exception because they're hard of heart. And then he goes on to show that he is the lawmaker. He can change it. In fact, he re he doesn't change it. He reestablishes the law in marriage. Finally, they give up. They, 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 can't, they can't get this guy. He just wiggles out of absolutely everything with like two words. And the people are in utter amazement. They're in utter amazement. Remember, they send people to go arrest him. And that the soldiers come back and they're like, why didn't you bring him? And they're like, well, we never heard anybody talk like this before. We've never heard this before. And so they start berating these, these soldiers. But then finally, all these different groups, these factions, these, 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 this, this authority that comes after him, the, church, the different parts of the church authority, they come after him and they say, tell us by what authority you do these things and who gave you this authority? Now, this is a question they have every right to ask. They have every right to ask, why are you doing this? Where do you come from? But the problem is, he's been doing this now for three years. And they didn't ask anything before. So in a way, they've squandered their authority. But our Lord doesn't say that to them. He gives them one more chance. And he says, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. If you tell me this one thing, was St. John from God or no? And they couldn't say. They knew it. They knew all the people thought so. They knew that St. John the Baptist was from God. But they wouldn't say it. And because they wouldn't say it, they were dishonest, completely dishonest. They were not going to give any honest reply to our Lord. So at that moment, you see that moment they have repudiated. They've repudiated any authority that they have. What they did was they've repudiated their covenant with God. And what's it mean? Because we love to go on nowadays. You hear it all the time. The Jews are the chosen people of God. No, the Jews were the chosen people of God. Where does that, where does that choice come from? The choice comes from the fact that out of all the different groups of people in the world, God started a covenant with Abraham. He went to Abraham and all of his descendants. When he, when he finally comes to Moses, and with each one of those from Abraham down to Moses, he does a covenant. And that covenant was in blood. Moses says it. And then even later on, St. Paul talks about it. There is no covenant without death, without sacrifice. And the shedding, he says, the shedding of blood. Moses sprinkled the people when they made the covenant with the blood of the sacrifice that came from the altar, right? So in this covenant, happens with Abraham, happens with all of his, the other patriarchs, and then it happens again with Moses. This covenant is an established relationship with the living God. For them to wait for what? The Christ. Their authority, this authority that's now questioning our dear Lord, they are, they are sons of Abraham. They're under the law of Moses. They are the chosen people. They have repute, they, they've oftentimes killed, stoned, sawed in two. This is what St. Paul says in the letter of the Hebrews. They've, son, they've sawed them asunder. And all the, other, all the others that were sent by God, they killed them. Because they didn't like the message. But still, our Lord kept the covenant with, this, with these people. They were the chosen people. So he comes all the way to this moment. He's getting ready to shed his blood for them. And they're asking him all these questions. He gives them one last chance. And still they failed it. Father Isidore O'Brien, he's an OFM. There's a book. I hope we can republish it, but I can't, I can't find it right now to find out if there's a copyright on it it's um he's an ofm he just wrote a, a wonderful little commentary on scripture it's like the life of our lord the life of christ it's, it's a wonderful little book and he says so in his book on the life of christ he says they had every right to ask as they were the authority though they should have asked our lord at the very beginning of his active ministry and not at the end all the same, he gives them one last chance to act the part of the authority by asking them about St. John. 
Since, he says, since they refuse to answer his question, they show themselves, in a sense, as repudiating their authority. Now, this comes from Mark, I'm sorry, it comes from Matthew 21, chapter, uh, chapter 21, and Mark chapter 11. And so follows all those parables that our Lord gives. You can read it in there yourself. In these parables, he says, so what this means is that the Jews were the chosen people, not by right. They weren't chosen people by right, but by a covenant with God. God worked a contract with them. It was one he kept with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then finally with Moses. They were to keep his law and prepare and wait for his coming. This was the reason of the chosen people. To keep the law, it's, it's 613 precepts. I always get it wrong. It might be 614. I can never really keep it straight. It's like 613. 613. But see, if we can't even remember how many precepts they were, that's how difficult it was for them to keep them. See, because they had to keep every precept. We can't even remember the number. So they had to keep that whole law. And that's why St. Paul just says, you, you can't even keep the law. But their job was to keep the law. And because that law was so difficult to keep, the purpose of the law being so difficult to keep was to keep it fresh in their minds. They needed a Savior. There had to be a Savior, someone who would come and pay that debt. They knew they couldn't do it. They had to keep the law, which was imperfect. They had to kill sheep and goats and turtle doves. And that was imperfect. Because it couldn't, it couldn't wipe away sin. It was just accepted by the living God. They knew that the Christ had to come to pay the debt. But that authority who was, who was there only to prepare and wait for his coming weren't able to see it when he came. That was their whole job. That chosen people was only meant to wait for his coming and to receive him. And now they have the living, they have the, they have, they have the Son of God made, made flesh. God made flesh in, the, in, their, in their midst, the Christ. And they don't accept Him. And that was the only reason for their authority. This covenant was a contract. Since by repudiating Him and putting Him to death, they make the final act of their infidelity and they break the contract officially. Now it's officially broken. They, they killed all the prophets and our Lord still didn't abandon them. They did all the things they did. He still didn't abandon them. They, they kept going back to worshiping idols the whole time. It just keeps happening over and over and over again. And he still doesn't abandon them. Now he comes and they abandon him. And our Lord says, now this is what's going to happen. And right, because of Matthew 21, now look at it. You get to Matthew 25, and he's just weeping over Jerusalem. There won't be a stone left on a stone. So the final act of their infidelity or breaking the contract, which caused their inheritance to be shifted to a new people, and this is what those Jews said that were trying to ensnare him. He asked, so what should be done? Talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the owner of the vineyard who, who, who he wants the, the due fruits of in good season from, from his own vineyard. And he keeps sending his servants and then even his own son and they kill him because they want to take everything. And those, those Jews that were there, the authority that was there, they said, that those people, so what should happen? It should be shifted to a people that will, will give him his fruits in due season. They said that. Do you see that? Our Lord gets them to say what the punishment should be. He gets them to say what the consequence is. And they even all say it. They know what the consequence is and they do it anyways. So keeping the law, they understood. At least they had an idea of how to keep the law. But what about us? 
We have a law. We tend to live sometimes like Christians that don't have a law. And this is one of the things I was talking to you all about. And I know the people inside the computer weren't there. But w w when we were when we had to talk just now for the for the vestiture, we were talking about secular religious life, as we so often do. Um, but that difficulty of being out in the world and being able to still live that fervent religious life that we're all called to. But we are called to a law, and it's a law of love, which means when St. Saint, when Saint Augustine says, <clears throat> love and then do what you will, it's because it's conformity to love itself. When you love God with all your heart, you can act freely because you'll never do anything to offend Him. It would, it's so disgust you to offend our Lord, you'd never dare do it because you love Him, right? It doesn't mean love Him and go do whatever you want, like Luther thought. That, that, that's not how it works. We love him, therefore we'll never offend him. Not because what we do won't offend him, because we won't do those things that offend him. Do you see? It's a love for him. That's what, that's what the fear of God is. We've talked about that a lot. But that fear of God is the fear of offending someone who, who you love and who loves you so much. You, you, don't, you don't fear the lightning bolt. We're not worried about the lightning bolt. We're, 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 we fear offending God who is love. But what about us? How does this parallel to us? And this is how we have to read Scripture. We have to not just focus on the Jewish people who are repudiating our Lord at that moment and trying to, and trying to see how, see, they were all wrong. See, they all did it wrong. I mean, th this, it's us. When you look at it, we're doing the same thing. It, we, we've done it in our lives. It was the quote that we gave all of you. I, I gave them a quote, and I'll, I'll read it to you real quickly here from St. Paul to, Tim, uh, to T Titus. Oh, man, if I could just find it. Here we go. He's given an admonition in chapter 3 in Titus where he's just talking about um, that we shouldn't speak evil of men and things like that, but we should be ready to do good works. And he goes on to say, For we ourselves also were sometimes unwise, incredulous, erring, slaves to diverse desires and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But the difference with us is we live in a different time. Our Lord's already come, thankfully, because I fear, I fear that I would have been one of those Sadducees, or one of those Pharisees, or one of those lawyers, or one of those Herodians. But when the goods, when the, when the goodness and kindness of our God and Savior appeared, not by the works of justice, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us by the lather of regeneration and renovation the Holy Ghost. I don't need to go on. The main thing I wanted to look at was the fact that we have been incredulous, erring, slaves to desires, pleasure-seeking, living in malice, envy, hating, hating, being hateful and hating one another. So how often have we been scrupulous, though, about keeping the precepts of the church? That scrupulosity I run in all the time. Can we do this? Can we do that? Are we allowed to do this? Are we allowed to do that? But in the end, but in a way, we don't really accept the Christ. And what, we mean, what I mean is this. Remember, our Lord said it in, in St. John's Gospel multiple times. If you love me, keep my commandments. We just pass right over that. He says it multiple times. If you love me, keep my commandments. We say we love him. And then we don't keep the commandments. The whole point is that love for God, we, our precept is a precept of love, to love God above all things for, for his own self. To love ourselves for his sake and our neighbor for his sake. When we love ourselves, which we have to love more than our neighbor, you're wrong to think you don't. That's diffidence that we always talk about. You have to love yourself more than your neighbor. Because if you don't save your own soul, you're not going to save your neighbor. 
God created you so that you'd go to heaven. You have to love your own soul to want to get to heaven. If not, what's the point of you trying to get everybody else to heaven? But we only love God, as we said. We only love God in as much as we love. We only love our neighbor in as much as we love God. So you can't just have a love for God and cancel out your neighbor and have that backbiting hatred for that one person at the parish you can't stand. It's not Again, it's not wrong that you can't stand the person. It's wrong that you do the backbiting. It's a natural thing to not, not want to be around them. It's wrong to treat them like your enemy. Do you see the difference? I've, I've talked to people before that they feel like they can't go to confession because they, they, can't, they can't forgive their, their neighbor. And you know, why can't you forgive your neighbor? Well, I don't want to go out to eat with them. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You don't have to go out to eat with them. You've got to forgive them. But they think that like you can't, you're not forgiven unless you get to go have coffee together and chit-chat like your friends. But that's not that's not forgiving your neighbor. That that that's, we have to have a better idea of how how it all works, right? We have to forgive them and want good for them, not any evil. And not wanting not wanting evil doesn't mean not wanting to have coffee with them. I don't have to go have coffee with people I can't stand. I have to treat them well and be be ready to pull them out of a ditch and help them when they need it and pray for them when I know they need it and love them as, as, as I would love anybody else and maybe even more. But it doesn't mean I have to go have coffee with them, right? So how, how are we to keep this law? Or how is it that we don't accept Christ? I sent you prophets and teachers. I didn't have time to look up the quote, but when our Lord sent us prophets and teachers, it's one of the parables in Matthew and in Mark, right? What well, does that apply to us? No, that's just the Jews. They did everything wrong. They did. Now this will go on YouTube probably, and they're going to say, Friar Anthony, they'll just listen to that one snippet and they'll call the police. No, no, we're just talking about the people that were there, the chosen people at the time of Christ. So we, we can't just look at them and do that. Who are our prophets? Who are our teachers? They're usually the difficulties that come into your life. They're, 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 they're the sicknesses that, that, that really put you in bed. They're the things that stop you from doing what you want to do. They're the enemies that you have in the workplace. They're the enemies that you have or the people that abandon you and your families. I sent you prophets and teachers because our law is a law of love, and that love came only through the cross. And the cross has to be lived, because if we don't pick up a cross and follow our Lord, you're not even his disciple. Do you see? I sent you, I sent you teachers, and I sent you prophets. And what have you done with those teachers and prophets? I'm only pointing fingers at you. I have to reflect on myself, too. I'm not saying I've, I handle everything perfectly. Don't think I'm trying to say that, but I have to point a finger at you all because you're there. But you have to, re this is something to reflect on throughout the month. I sent you prophets and I sent you teachers. And think how often we didn't accept it. We didn't accept those prophets. I don't accept those teachers. I don't want that furnace humiliation. I'm not okay with it. Then we do the why God thing. And then you don't accept them. So he sends us difficulties and trials to teach us as the prophets taught the people and prepared them for Christ. Our prophets, our teachers prepare us for Christ. When does Christ come again? Does Christ come again? Are we waiting for Christ to come again? You would think we don't want him to come. I don't want to get rid of the phone. I don't want to downsize the house. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I don't want anything to interfere. I've got my path here and I want people to see it. I want them to see the way I live. I'm good. I'm a good person. I hear it all the time, even from religious now. So-and-so is a good person. They don't practice the faith. They don't practice the faith. I, I, I know they're a good person. If, if my tire blows out, they'll probably stop and help me, whereas a, a daily communicant's going to pass me by because they're late for Mass. But he's at least going to stop and help me change my tire, right? So he is a good guy. But remember, we always have to stay on the level of natural and supernatural. The Masonic natural good guy doesn't save anybody. Only the faithful supernatural good guy does. 
we have to be preparing for that because at the end, and you're only here for that end, is the final judge. Whether he comes with the trumpets blasting on the cloud and we're taken up with him, that's the final day, or our death. Most of you are going to die before that happens. I say you because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here for it. I'm going to be, at least I hope to be here for it. That's the thing. We want the end to come, right? If we don't want the end to come, what are you doing at Mass? That's what's happening at the consecration. We're all looking in the same direction, hopefully, and we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. I, I know I've talked about it before, but that's why the altar at St. Peter's is out because his, the choir was for behind the altar and the people were in front of the altar and the Pope looked down towards the people. Those doors, when you open it, is due east. And right before, um, right at the end of the offertory, the deacon would come out and tell them all to turn. And they all would turn and the priest, they would turn their back on the priest and they would all wait for the coming of the Lord. Do you see? So liturgically, there's been some changes, meaning like, well, you know, in America, you can kind of only put the church where you can put the church and you got the cross where you got the cross. So that's become our liturgical uh, viewpoint. We're all facing the cross. That's our east. But we're all waiting for the coming of the Lord. And so that's what these prophets and these teachers are there to teach us. That is our trials and our hardships and our humiliations and our difficulties and all the all the all the being abandoned so many different times in life. It it, it just it's just kind of the way I was even with a religious community recently, and I heard so many times how many hurts there were, until finally I just had to say, "There's nothing here. There's nothing here to be heard about. You're fine. This is these are the prophets. These are the teachers." If you don't have these, you don't grow in perfection. Stop wallowing. Stop wallowing in these difficulties. They're blessings from God. If you wallow in them, if you constantly focus on the gnats that are swarming your face, you get discouraged. But if you, if you shoo the gnats away and you just keep going, you're fine. In the mountains, sometimes when you get up in the mountains, like in Wyoming, they got the... the the red the wind river district the wind river range and that's where the mountain ranges get about 13,000 they're consistently 13,000 feet and they're on the continental divide there's snow up there all the time it's really just magnificent but when you go up there in like July or August there's just mosquitoes everywhere so the only thing you can do to avoid the mosquitoes is walk fast just keep walking and they 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 they're not bothering you as soon as you stop to take a break, there's just mosquitoes all around you. And if you try to stop and sleep, you're doomed, right? You just even even getting into your tent, there's just no possible way. You zip the thing up right away and you've just got, you know, you've got to go around and try to find them all. It's just you spend the whole night trying to kill all the mosquitoes. The point to it is that's what all the troubles, that's what the teachers and the prophets, they give us these different things in our life to help us on our way in our preparation to receive the Lord. We're waiting to receive the coming Lord, right? Whether he comes at your death or he comes with a trumpet blast, we still have to receive him. It doesn't matter which one we're waiting for. It matters that we're waiting for it. Do you see? We're striving for it. So how do you keep all those woes, those worries, those trials, those things that break us down? Well, you don't stop and let them get in your eyes and fly around in your ears. Anybody who's tried to sleep out in the mountains or on a beach where there's actually a lot of mosquitoes, it just drives you nuts because you can't sleep. They just get in like your ears and they just buzz around and they're biting you all night long, right? So what do we do? As pilgrims, you keep walking. You just keep going and you leave all that stuff behind, right? We accept our prophets. We accept our teachers and we accept them for the coming of the Lord and we keep going to him. This life's not about resting and enjoying the fruits of our labor this is the thing. Is every, we want to build the barns, and we want to act like we don't build the barns. We need to just keep walking. So we need to reflect <clears throat> on how often we have rejected these prophets and these teachers that our Lord sent us. We have a covenant 
not in a people by external sign. The Jews had a covenant because they received circumcision. You could see it in their flesh, right? Some people go so far to say that our Lord didn't even have the loincloth on. They could see the circumcision. He was one of their people. I'm not so sure. Uh, Mary of Agreda says that they couldn't get the thing off of him. They, they couldn't get the loincloth off. He was not. The modesty of our Lord, he was not going to allow it. He wasn't going to allow it. And maybe, maybe it wasn't our Lord. Maybe it was Our Lady's prayer not going to allow it. Do you see? It shows us how modest we ought to be. So they had a circumcision that was in their flesh. But our circumcision, remember, their circumcision, it, it equated to our baptism. But theirs is a sign in their flesh. Ours is a death in Christ. It's a mystical death in Christ. It's a conformity, not, not to a collective people because of a sign in our flesh. It's a conformity to a person because of his death. Because of our baptism, we die with him and we rise with him. There's a real covenant there. It means a covenant we enter into into new life whether you're a baby or not, because a parent has a right to have their child conform to Christ and eliminated or to be, uh, to be freed from the slavery of the devil. They, that's why the, the parent has the duty. The child's baptized in the, what do they say? It's baptized in the faith of the church because you have a duty to teach them the faith. That's why we have so many people walking away from the faith. Then the grandparent wants to baptize everybody in the bathtub. Because the, the, the parents didn't do the job. They had the baptism, and they didn't give the faith. They didn't show them how they were circumcised. They didn't show them their covenant. The covenant of holiness to be perfect as the living God is perfect. To follow our dear blessed Lord in imitation of His gospel way. So we received a covenant but it's in the death of Christ, sealed in His blood. Our covenant is to reject Satan and all of his works. If you're ever wondering what it is, go back and read your, the baptismal promises. Yeah, your parents might have made them for most of you. I know there's converts here, but your parents might have made them for you. Uh, it doesn't matter. We renew them. You go back and renew them. Renew your covenant. And in fact, when we make our consecration of the Blessed Virgin Mary, not only are you renewing a covenant of your baptism, you're making the promise again of your confirmation. I promise not only to live the death and resurrection of Christ, I promise to give it all to the Blessed Virgin so that I can be just like Christ at Nazareth. That I can be just like Christ on the cross next to the Blessed Virgin. We give it all to her and she makes Christ live. Only she gives birth to Christ. And that's what we want. We want constant birth of Christ in us. Do you see? So our covenant is to reject Satan and all of his works. It is to be followers of Christ and to be perfect. That means to be holy. Holiness and perfection for us come from our growth in virtue. Walking away from sin and developing the virtues. That's only going to happen if you actually pray. But a lot of us don't pray. We, we, we make the excuse, I'm distracted. We make the excuse, I got work to do. We make the excuse of this and that and whatever else. You have to pray. There's no perfection without prayer. Nor is there salvation without prayer. St. Alphonse has said it. Qui si salva, qui si prega si salva. He who prays is saved. Because you're not going to be saved without asking for it. It's a grace from God. He wants it and he will not dole it out to you unless you want it too. But wanting it is a participation in living that covenant. Because that covenant isn't just being a member of Christ's people now. It's a mem it, it means to be holy. He deserves to have a holy people. Do you see? There's a real covenant there to strive for holiness at all costs. So it doesn't matter what's going on in the government. It doesn't matter what's going on in the church. 
It doesn't matter what's going on at Rome and with the Pope and with the bishops and with the priest and this and that and blah, 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 blah. You have the exact same covenant you had at your birth when there maybe wasn't these problems. And you're going to have the exact same covenant at the day of your death, whether these problems are there or not. So to be baptized is to be conformed and made a true member of the body of Christ. Not this generic membership, but the immaculate, beautiful body of the one Christ Jesus. And that's what gets you into heaven. If that's what they see on that day, if you accept Christ, that's what they see. Meaning if you accept your prophets and your teachers and you're preparing for that coming, whether at the end of your life, or at the final coming when the trumpets blast. That's what that's what you that's what they see. That's why that's why you get into heaven. Because Christ is in you. You are a member of Christ. You have to get that into your head. You've got to you got to reflect on it until it becomes very real. We use these words so that they become vague to us sometimes. And we have to re-enliven re re what they actually mean. If this is true, then how can you make yourself a member of Baal? I didn't get to get the, the quote, but uh, Baal was one of the false gods, whatever, you know, they make sacrifice to him and stuff. Now, this is, this is what St. Paul, I couldn't get the quote. I didn't have time to do it. This just came from reflection. I, j I jotted down. But you can go back and look it up. But um, there's, there's places in the letters of St. Paul. I think this is where this comes from. That is, how can we be a member of Christ and a member of Baal? How can we be a member of Christ, and St. Paul does this, say this, and the, mem the, and the member of a harlot? Do you see? How can we donate ourselves to something that's filthy? And that's what the sin is. Any sin, pick any one of the ten, those commandments that we're supposed to follow. Pick any one of those, and gravely offending against that is binding yourself to whatever harlot that is. Whatever false god that is, bringing you whatever pleasure that is, to say that backbiting word, to take that thing that's not yours, whatever it is, to enjoy that thought. So we're not to have a public but a private life. Our public life. Our public life has to be who we just actually are. That's who the public life is. Our private life is what needs to be hidden. When you pray, go to your room and shut your door. That's your private life. Your private life is not the filthy things. Your private life is not the words you shouldn't be saying about somebody else. These private lives have to go. The private life has to be behind that closed door in prayer. So not, that's not just the closed door. Our Lord's saying that because we're not to blow the trumpet like the Pharisees do and letting everybody know all the holy things we're doing. The private life is what illuminates the soul of a Christian. It's, what, it's the penance that brings you in conformity with Christ. It's the illumination that comes through the imitation of the virtues of Christ. It gets to the point where you can't hide it anymore. Because holiness can't be hidden. You don't have to go around trying to get people to see that you're holy. Because I can tell you, when people go around saying you're holy, you know it's just a sham. They, they say it to us friars all the time. Wherever we go, we get told how holy we are, right? And the, the friars have learned their lesson. They know it's just a whole, it's a sham. We can't get caught up with hearing people telling me, you don't know who I am. You don't know what I'm into. You don't know what I just did, what I just said to one of the friars, how uncharitable I just was a few minutes ago. You don't know. Who are you to be telling me I'm holy? There's one who's holy and there's one who we enter into that holiness. That's what perfection is. When he, told, when he tells us to be perfect, like he's perfect. I know I've told you a hundred times. It's a, per, it's a participation. In the holiness. It's not holiness that you are holy. You're not holy. 
Don't worry about going around telling everybody you're holy, showing everybody how much you pray, what penances you do, how you really you're always doing things for these people and that and this and whatever else. No, the holiness, we're, we're, we're as holy as we are conformed to Christ. And you can never be perfectly holy in this life because you're still going, right? Perfection comes when you can't go anymore. And we have to arrive at that perfection. So when I said you're not holy, it's not true you are holy. You're a holy people. You're a priestly people. Anyone who's in the state of grace is holy. But I'm talking about it from the, from the external. The, the holiness we want people to see. The show that we want them to see. That we want people to read our journals later. We want them to find them and see we've written things that are very holy. And we want them to kind of talk about them and then write books about us later. So when we're writing our journals, we, we know in the back of our mind, like, someone's, this is really good. Somebody's going to find this. <laughs> and they're going to write things about me. I know it. That's the stuff we have to be really worried about, concerned about. And not, not necessarily concerned about because there's scrupulous people that are watching this or listening to this. And the scrupulous, we don't want to add any more burdens. All you do is you shake those things off. You shake these things off. You don't, you don't allow these things to take any grip. You don't entertain them because they're silly. We don't entertain silly things. So our private life should be our interior life, our spiritual life. That should be our private life. And that we really have to reflect on. Before men... You should always be the same. You should just be who you are. They're all going to see your wretched private life. If you keep it, they're all going to see it. At the end, everyone will see it. And don't think you won't care then. You're going to care. You're going to care. It's going to be the most humiliating thing, and it never goes away. It's called the worm of conscience. It will fester and burden you in hell for eternity. It's a horrible moment to have everyone know all the private filthiness of your life. Now for the saints, they still have their private fil filthiness, some of them, right? Because they, they, were, they repented. A lot of the saints repented. Some of them did terrible things. Murderers, adulterers, etc., etc. It just goes on. But they repented. And they will all be manifest to their glory. Because even though they did that many horrible things, God's grace triumphed in their life. Do you see? That's a big deal. And that's what St. Paul is saying in here. Now we have to manifest. So it's a faithful saying, and these things I have the affirm constantly, that they who believe in God may be careful to excel in good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now those good works, that's not that external private, that, that external public guy. These, in, these works is becoming holy. You can't hide holiness. It gets manifested when God wants it manifested. It gets, it, gets, it gets recognized when God wants it recognized. And you'll know whether or not this is bearing good fruit because you will be humiliated and you will do everything to hide the fact that people are noticing your virtue. Does that make sense? Maybe it doesn't. St. Paul does talk about in different places, it is good. And even, even when we read when we read in uh, the spiritual theology books, at times it is good to let people see our good works, meaning our good virtue. Because like if I work at a place, we have, we have one of our postulants, our aspirant, he had to go back to Canada before we can get him back. Hopefully the good soul is watching. Happy Easter if you are. Good but we're trying to get him back, but it takes a long time with the application process. 
he has to go off to work and he's working trying to learn different trades before he comes back so he can help us build stuff and things like that he's really trying to use his time real well but in the workforce people use those phones and they look at that stuff they shouldn't be looking at and they try to get everybody else to look at it too so in an environment like that would you want to manifest your good works that is your good example you do you do want to manifest your good example you want to manifest your chaste eyes you want them to see it you want to manifest your chaste tongue you want them to see it you want to manifest your good discipline you want them to see it because if they don't see it where do they ever get to see christ if you're in a state of grace he dwells in you the holy trinity dwells in you you're a temple of the holy ghost this is when we manifest not to all of our all the people we want to have a good name with to the people who are lost that's how we evangelize we make christ or we should make christ present that's the whole purpose of secular religious life to be christ in the world and christ always dies on the cross just keep that before your mind before your mind's eye when you when you're upset about the prophets and teachers that our lord sends you so we have a contract with the living god on our part we're to be holy on his part he's to communicate holiness to us and he does that through the sacraments think about it why is the church around i brought it up before i know you all know i'm just asking you the same thing i'm a limited person i say i just say the same thing all the time why did he establish the church because he established sacraments the sacraments he when he dies on the cross he first pays back an offended god and then he merits all the graces that he applies to men where do you get those merits in the sacraments the church holds the key to the sacraments the sacraments give us the grace for salvation Eve, when you go to Mass, this is one of the things also I have to correct myself when I say you are holy. Correcting myself from when I said you're not holy. I just made the distinction. But you are holy. Anyone who goes to Mass because of the sacraments is made holy. If you receive our Lord, you're made holy. Ex opera operato. It's a work, a work that Christ works in you. You can't have contact with the all holy one and not become holy. Then there's your disposition, ex opera operantis. It's your participation, whether you receive those graces in abundance or not. You have to be open to them, right? You have to be willing that that's the subjective response to the objective redemption. So on our part, we're called to be holy. On God's part, He makes us holy. First and foremost through the sacraments. Then through prayer. Then through accepting your teachers and prophets. Even if we can't receive, like we friars right now are having a difficult, we don't get to go to Mass during the week. Even if we can't receive the Eucharist, this is how beautiful our dear Lord is and how much he wants to communicate that grace. Because if he requires us to be holy, then he's also going to give us the means to become holy, right? But not without us. He never does it without us. He won't do it without you. He wants somebody striving for holiness. Saints strive and they go through, they go through a warfare to get to it and they're willing to do it. That's what we're all called to do. But even when we can't get to him in the sacraments, we, we still can't get to him through prayer. But spiritual communions, people always forget. Remember, your spiritual communions, he wants to come to you. If you ask him to come to you in the Eucharist and you long to commune with him in the Eucharist, he gives all the graces of a holy, of a holy communion. The only thing he doesn't grant is his actual physical presence that's in the Eucharist. Do you see? But you receive all the graces. You receive the sanctification. You receive his actual person, just not, not the physical body and blood. 
every time you ask. St. Maximilian Kolbe made a spiritual communion every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes. I think he did like a 15-minute fast, and then he would take make another spiritual communion. Then he'd do a 15-minute fast, and he'd make another spiritual communion. He'd do that all day long, right? And you wonder why he became so holy. So let's remember our covenant with the dear, our dear blessed Lord. And it's a covenant of holiness. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. And the commandment that we need to keep for, uh, first and foremost is to be holy as the, whole, as the heavenly father is holy. That's a real work to be done. That's a real activity that has to take place. It's a real striving after God that we have to strive for. It's a real mortification when we desire something we ought not desire. Even the little things that are okay to desire, those things we mortify. Because we can mortify good things. Christ did. He, he, he lived a very difficult way. His mother did. If you read any, if you read the life of the the life of the Blessed Virgin, Venerable Mary of Agreda, it's just beautiful to see. They just they they could have eaten better, whatever. They just but they 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 they, they did penance all the time. Why? Why? Because it's a good thing.